Hey everybody, it's Adrian CryptoBurb speaking. Welcome to day three of our free trading congress. This is a virtual summit, virtual experience full of amazing, beautiful talents and people of insane knowledge in the field of financial markets and also in terms of the economic outlooks that we're going to discuss today with my great guest, Macro Alf. But before we get in straight to the very details and the depths of his amazing knowledge and the masterclass on the actual macro, we are going to play a little bit of a sweet intro and I'll catch you in a second. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. Founder and the CEO of themacrocompass.com. And just reading and following about his bio, unique macro insights it is. Interactive tools and portfolio strategy to step up your macro game. Former head of, attention, 20 billion portfolio. This is macro of, of, or per his full name, Alfonso Pecatiello. This is great to have you, Alf. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for hosting me here. And uh, let's see if I can, I can provide some value to the listeners. Grazie, grazie. Amazing. Okay, listen, everybody. This is uh, this is pretty exciting. This is actually the first time um, uh, I'm ever honored to have to have this this beautiful conversation with Alf. This is even more exciting because of that. But the topic for that is uh, well, macro masterclass, right? So we are supposed to run for a couple of of main points uh, about like how we can actually generate a little bit of an alpha, a little bit of Again, financial returns, if you will, eventually profiting and benefiting with the macro outlooks, because it's it's true that within cryptocurrency, which seems at times not to be so correlated to, to the financial markets outside of crypto, there is in fact a lot of correlation. There is in fact a lot of uh, a lot of in common that you know what, what the Fed is doing is it's definitely impact impacted also on the CPI print. So we're going to tackle all of this and the basics with us today. Uh, before we jump into the merits. Um, if you were to run us with a little bit of your story, Alf, uh, to TNN, all the viewers and all the listeners, how it's happened for you to be this man of this huge success that you are today? So it started, I think, when I was 15 years old, which sounds pretty young for finance, but um, the finance blood runs in my family. Uh, my mother um, worked at a bank, was involved in financial markets. Um, so when I was a kid, used to have lunch breaks after school and, uh, you know, eating my pasta. I'm Italian after all. I would see her looking at these screens and charts and I'd be like, what the hell is that? And, um, you know, I was a curious kid. So I just asked her, what is that? And she said, oh, that's a futures. I'm like, what? It's a, it's a financial instrument. It tracks that, that and that. Okay. So, and when you hear that almost every day, at some point when you're a kid, you start looking into it. You, know, it's, you became curious. And back then, there was no uh, Fin Twitter or uh, this fantastic free uh, learning experience. You had to look it up by yourself, which I did. And I found out that, wow, these were interesting things. And so I started asking questions here and there. And, uh, you know, university time came, 19, 20 years old. And I decided, okay, let's actually go for economic study. I started macroeconomics. I had already some experience because I was looking into this stuff. And then I became more and more passionate about it till I decided that this was what I wanted to do, uh, work in financial markets. I uh, started my career after the studies at 22 or 23 years old um, in a bank. And uh, I should say in fixed income, which is really my, uh, my passion. So then I became looking at bonds and derivatives and options and swaps and all that crazy stuff related to the bond market. And then the career went very fast because luckily um, I was always, again, a very curious person. So I made sure that um, I listened all the time to expert people. And because of my job, I had access to so much information uh, from, um, from that angle. I grew pretty rapidly. The performance was good. And so at some point, the bank decided to assign more and more responsibilities and assets to me till I became the, the head of a $20 billion portfolio uh, for the bank. It's a large European bank. And I did that for three to four years, uh, which was a very good experience to start taking a lot more risks and um, understanding the impact of liquidity in your decision making and managing a team of portfolio managers under you. 
Uh, also, you get access to so much um, information from central bankers to politicians to prime ministers. You can have access to almost whatever you want. But what always bothered me is that I could get access to that. And that was some sort of knowledge reserved for the ivory tower, if you wish. It's just a limited amount of people that get that kind of access to data, knowledge, uh, information. That always bothered me. Uh, to the point that, you know, after the pandemic, I effectively decided that this wasn't really what I wanted to do. I mean, make money for the bank, nice, but it's not exactly what I wanted to do in life. So I decided to quit. Um, my wife was uh, not particularly happy about the decision. I mean, you can imagine you have a uh, highly paid job, um, the relatively young age. I decided to quit that because I wanted to try and see if there was an appetite for uh, a market of people wanting to share that knowledge with me. So I, I started the Macro Compass. It's uh, my free newsletter uh, on Substack. And I started on, on social media, Fin Twitter, at Macro Alpha, and all that kind of stuff. And it grew rapidly, exponentially. It was really nice to see that a lot of people were interested in, in learning and stepping up their game. And, uh, you know, the journey has been beautiful so far. And here we are. Amazing. Just, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's sounding a little bit crazy for such a short period of time uh, because, well, studying at 15 is definitely a challenge on its own. But, you know, when we when we don't really think much about finance, when we don't really think much about futures, like you mentioned. So it's it's uh, it's definitely different than most of the stories I, I, I tend to hear. Uh, but that's what makes it even more interesting, because it's definitely, again, having your close to 310,000 followers on, on Twitter is an amazing success already. So congratulations. And for everybody who is watching that and who, for whatever reasons, you know, had not chance to, to actually uh, meet Alf, make sure you rush all over his Twitter at MacroAlf and definitely press a follow on him. Uh, press a follow, leave this um, definitely your mark within his community. This is definitely more than well-deserved. Uh, and having just a little bit of your, of your background story, you know, um, the question that I think many traders, many investors, especially in the crypto scene is like, why should I care about macro at all? Like, what does it give me? The question goes to you. Why care about macro? Um, you care about macro because if you don't, then macro will take care of you. That's something that my mentor used to say. Um, macro is a very broad term, but it really stands for trying to piece together the puzzle, which is global financial markets and the economy. So crypto was basically a new asset class that was born uh, roughly 10 years ago. It was very small until 2018, 2019. And then it became violently big and it took the attention of, um, of everybody. Uh, but the reality is that a lot of people thought that crypto and the digital asset space was uncorrelated to macro. It was a thing per se, and then, you know, it just didn't bother about macro conditions. And 2021, with that rapid rise in digital asset prices, and 2022, the rapid decline in digital asset prices, actually are, uh, I think, teaching or sending a very strong signal to investors in the digital asset space that, Macro is important for the cycle, even in crypto. And at the end of the day, because crypto is an asset class, because it has become so big, because it has become known, it's almost natural that at some point macro becomes a vital part of it. So at this point of the crypto cycle, where it's become a known asset class, where it's on the radar of everybody, Every hedge fund manager is tracking Bitcoin every day to have a gauge of risk sentiment, to understand how the crypto community is doing. You cannot expect it to be uncorrelated from macro. Actually, it will be more and more correlated over time. But that's good. That's good because if macro crypto investors understand and learn about macro, they will have an additional edge on understanding the cycles of this asset class too. Hmm. Very good explanation. You know what I've noticed in very interestingly um, while while gaining on my CMT title, Travel Market Technician. You know, I was I was busy studying also the correlations, right, the intermarket correlations, uh, but more on the more also on the, on the technical side of it, right, other than on the macro side. But we know that ever since the free market kind of like you know 
principles were introduced and put into practice, the market started correlating, then the internet came in and the markets became, you know, much more um, overall popular, if you will. So the things started to correlate, even though they, did, you know, they used to not be correlated before. And, and here we are, right, with cryptocurrencies actually trading most of the year um, so far this year, 2022, like stocks. However, there are a couple of, uh, of moments, and right now is an actual moment that, we, that we're talking about for the first time this year, that crypto and Bitcoin is trading in an inverse relationship, a negative correlation, strong negative correlation. Last time I checked, I think it was at minus 0.56. Uh, right now, the, when I'm opening the chart, of course, pre-market, it's minus 0.64 on the seven week correlation coefficient basis, right? So this tells me again that uh, first of all, there is a little bit of fluctuation, right? That there is not kind of like this one regime that that it's always going to be like, you know, this uh, people love those phrases like decoupling. Bitcoin crypto is decoupled from stocks, right? Like when is decoupling happening? And this is all fluctuation. So now you're mentioning that, of course, that there is a lot of correlation and that all of those big hedge fund managers are actually tracking Bitcoin as a risk asset. It kind of like proves the point a little bit that it's that it's become become significant as the risk factor. Uh, like, how would you personally view Bitcoin? Is it like an actual risk barometer for you, or is it kind of like a yeah. tool just to support your your thesis? So, um, Bitcoin and the crypto space in general they benefit um, from macro conditions when the following happens, Adrian. When there is a lot of money being um, printed and injected into the private sector, the private sector is us, um, households, corporates, and when uh, monetary policy conditions are very, very loose. So when the cost of borrowing, the cost of leveraging up is pretty, pretty small. So that exactly that happened in combination in an unprecedented fashion in 2020 and early 2021. So a lot of people say, Alf, um, the Fed printed money. And I say, guys, please take care uh, on this topic and pay attention. Money that we use is the money that is actually can be printed and can be increased in size by the government and by banks. And they did so in 2020 and 2021. The United States government actually sent $5 trillion on the bank account of consumers. And those are not reserves, funky money for the financial system. It's money for us. It's literally our bank account that goes up in size. And that happened a lot and that happened very rapidly. And so that's when you give spending power to people. You give purchasing power to people. It's when the government cuts taxes, or like in this case, it sends checks at home to people. And that happened in a very rapid fashion. The Federal Reserve on top of it was basically telling everybody, guys, you can borrow as much as you want. It's as cheap as it's ever going to be. A 30-year mortgage was below 3% in the US for 30 years fixed rate. It's, it's never been seen. So the combination of the two led to the perfect setup for Bitcoin and crypto to deliver strong performance. There was a lot of risk appetite, a lot of stimulus, both fiscal and monetary, and ultimately it played out in the price. So great. And now we are seeing the opposite. We are seeing a contraction. We are seeing a fiscal drag and other fiscal impulse in the economy. The last time that the US government sent a fiscal stimulus to people was April 2021. That's one and a half years ago since the last financial, uh, fiscal stimulus. We are now trying to withdraw resources from the economy, withdraw resources from the private sector because inflation has become a problem and policymakers want things to slow down. Also, the Federal Reserve is making borrowing very expensive now. Go try and get a mortgage. It's not 3% anymore. It's 7% if you're lucky. So all of that basically slows the animal spirits. It slows risk appetite. It slows and reduces the amount of risk appetite that people have and investors have. And with a little bit of a lag, this macro cycle unfolds into crypto as well. And we start to see drawdowns in the asset class. So... Coming back to your original question, the way I look at crypto is um, twofold. I consider it a macro asset class like equities, like bonds, like gold. It's a macro asset class. It follows cycles. And so understanding how macro evolves will give you an edge 
in trying to understand what the next cycle is for Bitcoin. Also, I consider it something that could be very interesting as a future use case um, when it comes to changing our monetary system. So our monetary system is based on free creation of new money, basically. There is no hard limit, no hard stop to the ability, both of the United States government, they can just increase their debt size, they can print new money. Um, there is no inherent limit to that. And also to banks. Banks can lend money whenever they want, as long as people don't default and they pay back. There is no inherent limit on the amount of money creation. Last time we tried to change this system into something that is pegged to a hard asset, it was the gold standard. The gold standard didn't end very well. So what we are doing now instead is putting no limits on the amount of credit creation, of money creation. And I wonder if we would want to come back to a system that is pegged to something, what is the role that crypto would play in that, in a world that is much more financialized, much more technological than it was when the gold standard was there uh, before the 40s, uh, sorry, up until the 70s. So again, I think it could have a role, a more structural role, but don't confuse cycles with structural trends. Structural trend can take decades to unfold. In the meantime, you'll have plenty of these cycles unfolding in front of you in crypto. So it's important to link crypto with macro cycles. Mm. Very good, very good explanation. Uh, more so that, in fact, you, you did manage to, to point out those secular trends, those, those big, big, big trends. Uh, I know that some of um, some of the academics, you know, uh, would actually, you know, again, dispute whether or not certain waves like Kondratiev waves, right, would exist that would take five, seven decades basically to develop and which which kind of like, you know, perhaps we're in this, you know, declining or inclining of the Kondratiev wave. It's, it's very interesting because, of course, there's little sample to it on such a long cycle, but uh, but it's definitely the takeaway already for all the viewers and the, and the listeners should be that it's important to track crypto within this macroeconomic environment overall. And uh, we are heading to the next point um, because I wanted to ask you, you know, briefly about like how you approach and how people can approach economy versus macrofinance, right? Because we have all those metrics. We have all those metrics in terms of like, you know, um, the new housing permits, right? Or what is it going to be for this overall CPI print or how the you know stock market is performing that the stock market tends to lead six to nine months, the economic cycle and all of that. So what is an actual um, macro financial role in this in, in the in the economy? Like do politicians track it at all? Do, should they track it uh, for, for the macro finance? So there are a lot of what I call forward leading indicators. I mean, when you analyze a macro cycle, it generally works like this. There are indicators that move early, that tell you where potentially we are going for the next 12 to 15 months. Some of these indicators are very useful and statistically consistent. They tell you whether the economy is likely to accelerate or decelerate. And they're mostly surveys. So they, for, for instance, there are this PMI, Purchasing Manager Index survey, where a survey gets sent out to large companies in the US and they get questions, a bunch of questions like, hey, uh, what do you see happening for new orders coming in? Is your business accelerating? Is it decelerating? Are you hiring people? Are you not hiring people? So because of these surveys, actually, you get a good idea of what large companies are about to do for the next six or 12 months. These, some of these are very good forward-leading indicators. Then after those, there are what I call the uh, coincident indicators. So it's basically the reflection of what's happening in the economy roughly today. Um, roughly. And so that would be perhaps industrial production or um, the labor market. The more you move towards hiring, that becomes already coincident to lagging because it's not like companies decide to fire somebody on the spot. Before they decide that, the, you know, their orders and their business must have slowed down already. What they do first is they cut discretionary spending. They don't spend a lot of money on marketing, for example. Only later on, they will start firing people. So the labor market is a coincident to slightly lagging indicator. And then you unfold into the full macro cycle with the lagging indicator. GDP growth, inflation, all that stuff takes a while after the cycle has evolved to play out in the data. So the thing is, policymakers, uh, central banks, they know this, but their mandate is often based on the lagging indicators. Take the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve now is trying to slow inflation down. 
And we just said that inflation is amongst the last items to move in a cycle, which means they will be making a lot of damage and be probably late in the process of understanding that they have already achieved quite a lot of slowdown and ultimately inflation will slow down, but they will keep at it until they achieve that objective. As an investor, though, you don't have a mandate. I mean, your only mandate is to preserve wealth and to you know, have a diversified and good portfolio in front of you, right? And to understand the risk you're taking and the risk appetite. You want to manage it through cycles. So the advantage that investors have, especially retail investors without a big boss on their back, tapping their shoulders or investors always demanding something, is that if they study um, macro cycles and understand how to face them, they have an advantage, a competitive advantage, understanding where the economy is going, where markets are likely to go. It's the same example I gave you before with crypto. At the end of 2021, um, on the macro compass, I came out with an article that said, guys, looking at the evolution of these forward-looking indicators and what they're pointing at, and the fact that fiscal stimulus is gone, and the fact that the Federal Reserve is becoming a bit attentive to inflation, I don't think the conditions are ripe anymore for a good year for crypto. So maybe it's time to reduce a bit the exposure, given the macro cycle ahead. And that actually played played well uh, because it, it saved people from drawdowns, at least people who were reading the macro compass. And it's, it's a process of um, really respecting the cycle and the framework. And it's data, it's analytics, it's, it's a little bit of work, but ultimately it will inform you on what's likely to happen ahead. I don't have a crystal ball, but it will give you a good probability distribution of what's about to come next. Mm -hmm. I get that perfectly. And speaking of the macro compass, I kindly recommend everybody again to rush over to, uh, to Macro Alf's Twitter because that's where he's got all of his links, you know, for the macro compass newsletter on Substack, right? And uh, I, I think just to paraphrase again a, a little bit and, and, and let people process that more easily, I think that when talking about microfinance, you know, and all of those, again, microfinance indicators and, and the macroeconomic side to it for the overall, so the financial markets, this is a little bit of a top-down approach that we should all as investors probably apply even a little bit um, with approaching cryptocurrencies, right? Because it's very, it's very kind of like difficult to try to isolate Bitcoin from the entire, again, overalls that's happened that, that are happening outside of crypto, which is why you have to respect, you know, the CPI, why you have to respect those leading indicators or forward-looking indicators, just like you mentioned, Alf. You know, and um, one of those, one of those uh, forward-leading indicators, if you will. Uh, are the stock prices, right? Uh, there is like this credit index, there is like the new orders, of course, that are coming in or the consumer sentiment, right? Because, of course, for the main economy of the US, you know, the consumer spending is what defines this overall GDP performance. We've seen this year, we've seen two quarters at negative GDP, right? Which arguably can classify that, uh, again, arguably can classify that under the terms of recession, right? So speaking of a little bit of this recession that had been coming, you know, basically coming and going, you know, in and out uh, this year between all of those headlines, what are your basic macro indicators that you would decide whether or not we are in recession? Yeah, um, I'm going to put an article today out, which is called, yes, sir, but recession when? Uh, so I, I looked and I refreshed my top five leading indicators. There are many more, but, you know, to make it short, I only look at five. And, you know, those actually are a combination of a lot of things. There is an, um, a four leading indicator on, the, on credit creation. So the amount of money that is created for the private sector. When you create a lot of money, it's very difficult to have a recession because, you know, people have a lot of money to spend. You just gave them money to spend, new created money. But when you stop printing all that money, then generally speaking, history tells us that the recession is about to come. Something else, uh, we talked about new orders. There is a ratio between new orders that companies are seeing against the inventory they're building. If everybody has their inventory full and there are no new orders coming, yeah, that doesn't look like a great indicator that there is strong economic growth ahead. Um, what about the housing market? The housing market is incredibly important to the economy. It's a very, very, very big market. The real estate is the biggest asset class in the world. It's bigger than equities. It's bigger than bonds. It's really large. And when economic, when housing activity comes to a halt, like it basically did this year, because prices are still very high, mortgage rates are unaffordable, so people aren't buying a house anymore. 
when housing activity slows that dramatically, history tells us that with a bit of a lag, 12 months, generally speaking, unemployment rate will pick up because all these construction workers, these brokers, these real estate related jobs, which in America are over 10 million jobs related to real estate. Hey, if there is no new business, at some point, those all these home builders, all these brokers, all these house flipping businesses will need to fire people. And so you fire people, you start having unemployment rate going up, and that classifies a recession. There are many of these indicators I will, I will talk through in the article. But the main point is that if I collate together all these indicators, it seems to me that the recession is likely to happen within March and April next year. Now, hasn't it happened already? There were two negative quarters of GDP growth. Well, I don't like uh, confining a recession definition within GDP growth only, because GDP can really be a very complicated measure and can, can be subject to a lot of seasonal adjustments. What I like to look at is the following. It's earnings and it's the labor market. There is no recession if people don't get fired. Let's be honest. The recession is classified by people losing their jobs. It's classified by companies not growing their revenues, but actually shrinking their revenues because spending is coming down. So it's inflation adjusted spending, so real spending and people losing their job. Those are the two things really that define a recession to me. And we haven't seen it yet. So we are, what we have seen is an economy that slowed down materially from 2021, pretty materially, but it's not yet a recession. We are flirting with it, but it's not there yet. My four looking indicators today are telling me that we will see a proper one rough starting between March and April next year. And the question I always get on top of it is, how bad is it going to be? Because one thing is, when, when does it start? And the other is, how bad is it, right? And there, I have to say, the average conclusion is bad to really bad is where it seems to land, looking at these forward-looking indicators. Because not only they're signaling a recession to start, but some of them are looking really bad, historically speaking. Some of them are looking like they were looking in 2008, to tell you something. So it could be, also from a magnitude perspective, a relatively harsh recession. The good news, if there is one, is that history suggests that the recession over the last 100 years was always able to slow inflation down. No exceptions. Of course, if you lose your job and your spending power goes down, guess what? At some point, you cannot sustain these inflationary pressures in the economy. The demand will go down and obviously inflation will come down too. So maybe it's not what the Fed wants. They want a soft lending. They want a very nice environment. Like, you know, you, you just have this GDP growth maybe at 0, 1%, and then inflation magically slows down to 2% in a year from now. They're not going to get that. They are going to get inflation to slow down, I think, but because they've got people fired, and that's going to be inevitable. Okay, so the way I like trying to put myself into the shoes of a very beginner trader, right? And we like, they've been for a lot this year. And now they are hearing Alfonso Pecatiello saying that 2023 is not going to be a good year. So, <laughs> so buckle up, tie your shoes up, everybody. Uh, it's not supposed to be soft landing per se, per what Alf says. And um, I'm, I'm really curious to, um, to hear your thoughts of about, well, uh, the, inter the inverted yield curve, right? Because we, you briefly mentioned 2023, of course, what is what it is to be expected for a proper recession in terms of like the you know job cuts and everything. Yeah. Um, but inverted yield curve again, this is a very popular tool, right? Of course, like again, those those um, those have been also along with the high energy spikes, you know, in the past have been kind of like predicting quite su su successfully, you know, the recessions. So they all happened, of course, right? Huge energy spikes, you know, inverted yield curve. And right now, the actual, you know, uh, securities, the actual treasuries are also in the mode where there is this inverted yield curve kind of like being maintained. I'm talking about, um, you know, two, 10 years minus two years, for instance. Like, so how would, it, how would it, again, just put your overall investing regime? How can, what can people expect in terms of like 2023? Uh, but knowing that site that the uh, stocks kind of like lead this, right? So how would you assess 
your, your overall portfolio, let's say, tips or, or the regime's directions for 2023, knowing about this inverted yield curve and recession? Yeah, good question, Adrian. And the yield curve is also um, another indicator that is basically suggesting that we are going to go into recession. It's almost infallible if you look at history. Um, and so when you look at this, you need to ask yourself two things. How much of this is priced in already? Because remember, when you take a position in markets, it's not like you're, you're taking it against yourself. You're taking it against the aggregate average of market participants. That's what one price is. is the average price that all participants can agree at that moment in time with the information they have and what they expect in the future. So then you need to ask yourself, what's priced in? And when I look across a bunch of asset classes, what I see pricing in is a slowdown in 2023. I see earnings per share in the S&P 500 largest companies being, you know, priced mildly positive. Normally in a good year, earnings per share in America grow 8 to 9%. And next year, they're priced to grow 4%. So that's below average. You know, it's a below average growth year. Is it priced to be a recession? Mm. In a recession, earnings drop by 20 to 30%. So a recession is not priced in that market. And a bit of a slowdown is. Then I look at what's called credit spreads. So I look at how much corporates have to pay to borrow on top of the government of the United States. So how much people are willing to lend to these corporates, but how much do they want to get rewarded for it in the form of a credit spread they get on top of the, of the yield they make on a treasury bond. And there, yes, those spreads have widened. It's signaling that companies are weaker and they're going to see weaker earnings and that the situation is tough a little bit. But if I look at levels against prior recessions, no way. Also there, we have prices low down, but not a recession. The bond market, yes, the curve is inverted, but do you know how many interest rate cuts are priced by the Federal Reserve in 2023? 50 basis point. So the market is priced for the Federal Reserve to go to 5%, 5% Fed funds, and then cut to four and a half by the end of next year. If you have a recession, Adrian, you're not going to cut by 50 basis points. You're going to do, you're going to cut more. So also there, it seems, if you look at different angles, that the market expects a slowdown. So the direction of travel is that one. I only think the magnitude of that move down would be much faster than what the market is pricing in. In that environment, how do you position your portfolio? Well, I take an, as an example, 2001. In 1999, anything that had a dot-com after the name of their company went through the roof. 150 times earnings, 2000, 200 times earnings, if they had any earnings at all. In most cases, they had no earnings. Animal spirits, right? 1999, beginning of 2000. Does it resemble you of 2021, where Carvana, Zoom, and all the other stuff, you know, it's just went to the roof? Animal spirits came 2000, exactly like 2022, when those animal spirits were removed from the market. The Federal Reserve started hiking interest rates. Very similar story, very similar. What happened in 2001, which would be our equivalent for 2023, is that the labor market started weakening. And earnings started dropping, which is what I expect again, basically a recession. The Federal Reserve cut rates in 2001, Adrian, by 500 basis point. I want to repeat that. In a single year, Fed funds rate was slashed from 6.5% to 1.5%. So it's a little bit inverse to what we're seeing right now, right? Yeah, Just but then a little bit. I'm trying to look into 2023, right? I'm making a parallel and I'm saying our 2022 was the 2000 in back then so the dot-com bubble burst and uh, right now in 2022 instead we have seen 60 70 percent drawdown in bitcoin in tech stocks in all of that right so what comes next is 2023 which is the equivalent of 2001 in this historical parallel is the year after uh, the dot-com bust so i look at that and in 2001 the federal reserve cut interest rates from six and a half to one and a half percent and now I'm saying, when I, I push that parallel, people say, wow, well, it looks interesting as a parallel, makes sense. That means we can buy again stocks, Bitcoin, everything. Because if the Fed cuts rate by, 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 by what, like 4 or 5%, I mean, we're getting rates at zero. It's, it's a party all over again. Then I ask people, tell me, please, what do you think the performance was of stocks in 2001? They dropped by 12%. 
what, what are you saying after the Fed cut rates by six and a half to one and a half percent? How come stocks didn't go to the moon? Well, they didn't go to the moon because people were getting unemployed and earnings were dropping. It was a recession. So the story is that the Federal Reserve cutting rates is not necessarily good for risk assets, risk appetite assets as well, like crypto in the first leg, because they're cutting rates, because things are really getting bad in the economy. And when things are re really getting bad in the economy, it's not the right time to buy stocks or to buy crypto. When you become more confident about that is when a lot of the damage has already been done. It's already being priced. Everybody's so pessimistic. And the Federal Reserve has already cut rates a lot and therefore is accommod accommodating again an economic recovery. When is that going to happen? Later in 2023. So what I'm saying is that for the first half of next year, at least, positioning the portfolio still needs to be done on a defensive way because a recession is yet to hit. It's not fully priced in. And even when the Federal Reserve starts cutting rates, that's not good for risk assets. People will be focusing on how bad the economy looks like at that point. Only later, there will be a chance to buy assets at very good prices. Very good breakdown. Very good breakdown, everybody. Um, I know I know that you've committed already a huge deal of your amazing wealth of knowledge, so I appreciate it. And I'm sure hundreds of people also and thousands who are going to watch this actually also appreciate it. And if you do, guys, make sure you actually hit the like as well for Alf right here. Uh, drop some nice comments for him to appreciate his wealth of knowledge and definitely rush over to his Twitter at macro at macro alf. Drop him a follow. You can definitely check, uh, definitely check and confirm it's going to be all about value for yourself. And before I wrap with the neck with the last uh, point about the golden tip for the viewers, I want to remind to everybody who who is watching this free trading congress day three show. Uh, number one, we have a giveaway. We have an exclusive giveaway going on that you can find the link for which in the video description if you're watching that on YouTube. If you're not watching that on YouTube, roll over to YouTube and that's where you're going to find this exclusive membership within the Burn Must actually also given away. There are only a couple of easy, very simple steps that you have to follow. I'm going to find the details uh, again displayed shortly on the in the screen. And uh, this is an exclusive giveaway. You're going to win free prizes, basically. I think this is a uh, pretty good payoff for, for like a minute of job, if you will. So uh, having you off again for, for the last uh, last few, few minutes, um, what is your golden tip for the viewers that you want to leave everybody with? Well, my golden tip is that 2020 and 2021 and 2022 have shown to everybody how important macro is. And macro is fun. That's the other thing because it's a never ending learning journey. It's getting your hands dirty, understanding how the economy works, how our monetary system works. It's a fantastic learning experience. It's really fun. And it will give you an edge when it comes to understanding macro cycles. Also, if you're a crypto investor, as I explained, it's becoming increasingly important and it will become increasingly important. So if you had fun or you were fascinated by this conversation, study macro. And the question I always get is, where do I start? Yeah, that's a, that's a very valid one. So... Uh, on Twitter, I put out a thread a while ago with the top 10 books, uh, macro books that I read and I, I found very insightful. I provide myself free education on the Macro Compass newsletter. It goes out once a week. It's everything I know put out there. From next year, we're going to start as well premium content where even more is going to get uh, delivered to you guys. Do it. Learn macro. It's important for your own risk management, for your own journey, learning journey over time. It will get you a much better understanding of how things work also in crypto. Perfect tip for the viewers, everybody. Macro is important. If you are a crypto trader, macro is important too to understand, again, this overall top-down approach, right? This main layer surrounding all of this tiny little market that crypto actually happens to be within this overall huge world and universe. This has been Macro Alf talking to you, everybody, for the past 40 minutes with an immense and amazing alpha, founder and CEO of the Macro Compass, Macro Alf. Again, follow him on Twitter at Macro Alf. Definitely subscribe to his newsletter, The Macro Compass, uh, on Substack. Definitely can recommend search through his uh, tweet feed you're going to and timeline you're going to find really a lot of relevant news. And before we disconnect, 
remember the giveaway link in the description one minute job may be at best and you're going to get free prizes stand a good chance enter the secret giveaway code which is basically free trading congress this is the name of our uh, virtual summit free trading congress and for which i thank you for participating alf uh this has been an amazing an amazing journey with you and uh alfonso picatiela has been our guest today thank you so much for coming over thanks adrian talk soon guys thank you talk soon that's all folks for now i've got for you definitely stay tuned you're not going to get away and escape so easily we have tons of an amazing value coming to you to your monitors to your screens uh, to your screens actually flowing right in a couple of moments so make sure if you're not subscribed to our free trading congress membership where you can uncover all of those in insane um, values inside of our premium membership area that is actually being given away for free right now for a very limited time and for a limited space rush over to the burbnest.com slash congress the burbnest.com slash congress that's where you actually getting all of those values streams is fine Sh uh, shows are fine but you this is this is just a, you know this is just a little bit of of, of an insight of what you're getting inside for seven days free that's been adrian talking to you guys and i catch you on the next sessions god bless bye bye